All righty, we are live. So welcome everyone to our Intersectional Disability Studies Speaker Series at SJSU. My name is Brian. I'm just here to welcome you all and get started. We're gonna give everyone just a few seconds to trickle into the webinar here, and then we'll get things going. Welcome. Oh, also let us know where you're joining from today. I'm over here in Pleasanton, which is over in the East Bay area. I'll add that into the chat. If you wanna introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're joining from, just make sure you select all panelists and attendees when uh, entering anything into the chat so that everyone can see what you're contributing. Hey, Amna, joining us from over in San Ramon. Sally's over in San Mateo. Awesome. All right, people are introducing themselves. Jennifer, all the way over in Iowa, welcome. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here. So welcome everyone again to the SJSU Intersectional Disability Studies Speaker Series. My name is Brian. I'm with the Connie O'Leary College of Education at San Jose State. I'm just here to get you all acclimated here and let you know that a recording of this event will be available afterwards on the same webpage where you registered for this event. Uh, captions are available in this webinar, so you can do that by selecting the live captioning option in the, uh, the Zoom menu. Uh, they'll also be available in the recording as well. Those of you who are attending today, your video and audio are automatically turned off, so you don't have to worry about being visible in today's webinar or recording, but please use the chat to communicate with one another and communicate with our presenter today, and there'll be a Q&A available at the end of today's webinar. So in addition to that, be sure to follow along on Twitter. Um, you can connect with our featured speaker for today, Lydia, as well as our Lurie College of Education, and use the hashtag DisabilitySJSU. So next, I'm going to pass it off to our Dean, Heather Latimer, to welcome you all and talk about our Institute for Emancipatory Education. Great. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you to everyone for joining us. It is so exciting to see in the chat the number of different locations, not only across the state, but around the country that people are joining from. We are really thrilled to have you here with us at San Jose State virtually in this space and to have this conversation today around disability justice and to emphasize and highlight the incredible work that our faculty and our partners are doing in this field. Uh, I'm, I am excited to be able to, to share that we launched this last year, our Institute for Emancipatory Education. This is something that is uh, on following as part of our strategic plan. A few years ago, we did a strategic plan that committed our faculty to doing transformative work and preparing transformative leaders in education uh, on, as therapists, uh, community leaders, school leaders, and as counselors in fields of, uh, uh, that are associated with those areas. And as part of that work, we really decided that we wanted to lean into an emancipatory stance across our teaching, our service, and our research. And so uh, uh, we launched this last year, the Institute for Emancipatory Education. It is an interdisciplinary institute that looks at how do we engage our partners and our communities from early childhood through to K-12 through to college and postgraduate education to think differently and center communities that have historically been marginalized in the conversations around the future of education. And so as part of that, we are thrilled that we are able to launch the Intersectional Disability Studies Speaker Series. And I'm gonna welcome Saili Kulkarni and uh, uh, Suda Krishnan as the leaders to share a little bit about what's happening in that series. We're there, there are two faculty members in our Department of Special Education and they are amazing. So I will stop talking and pass it to them. Thank you, Dean Latimer. Um, we um, are super excited to have everyone here. Um, we have just ourselves launched the Intersectional Disability Studies strand at SGSU. This is part of our Emancipatory Education Institute. Um, so myself, along with Dr. Sudha Krishnan, um, have been working this past summer to develop a couple of different um, programs and opportunities as part of this work. Um, and so I will um, pass it off to Sudha to introduce some of our activities here. Thank you, Saili. Um, 
the uh, goals of the um, uh, IDSS or the Intersectional Disability Studies strand for uh, this semester were to actually develop um, uh, a syllabus uh, for uh, the um, uh, uh, the syllabus for the transformative uh, leadership minor. And uh, it was uh, a very um, uh, interesting um, idea to um, uh, bring together a, a collaboration of many scholars and uh, uh, community scholars, parents, students, um, uh, faculty from um, uh, the educational uh, leadership uh, department and uh, uh, the uh, special education department to generate a syllabus that um, uh, would be um, uh, used in an inter to in the creation of a course for intersectional disability strands. Um, so um, we also um, wanted to generate a community engaged and a culturally sustaining space that creates a disability visibility and a disability as an intersectional uh, marker of identity. Um, and uh, for that, we have a book club uh, that uh, focuses on uh, the disability visibility book uh, uh, by Alice Wong, uh, which we are reading as a faculty and trying to incorporate into our uh, syllabus. And uh, through all these efforts, we want to create a space for uh, uh, intersectional disability studies and accessibility in education within our um, uh, the College of Education and uh, the Institute for Emancipatory Education. And then um, I just wanted to say, yeah, just reiterate, you know, this is part of an ongoing series of projects that we're going to be using with the um, Intersectional Disability Studies strand. Um, and so, as Suda mentioned, we are generating a syllabus as part of the transformative leadership minor. Um, this speaker series will continue on um, with Alice Wong coming later in December. And we're also in the process of doing some, some research, some studying of our processes around co-constructing the course um, with multiple stakeholders, um, including community activists, including faculty, including family advocates, including students. Um, so we're really excited about this work. Um, again, I think Brian had already put the website for us in the chat. Um, please, you know, um, reach out and engage with us. We're really excited about this work. And yes, this is just a, um, a upcoming flyer for Alice Wong, who will be joining us December 2nd on Zoom. And with that, I'd like to um, introduce our featured speaker for tonight. Um, so I, it is my incredible pleasure to introduce Lydia XZ Brown. Lydia is an advocate, an organizer, attorney, strategist, and writer whose work focuses on interpersonal and state violence against disabled people at the intersections of race, class, gender, sexuality, faith, language, and nation. They are Policy Council for Private and Data at the Center for Democracy and Technology, focused on algorithmic discrimination and disability, as well as Director of Policy, Advocacy, and External Affairs at the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Lydia is also an adjunct lecturer and core faculty at Georgetown's Disability Studies Program and adjunct professional, professorial, excuse me, lecturer at American University's Department of Critical Race gender and culture studies. They serve as a commissioner on the American Bar Association's Commission on Disability Rights, chairperson of the ABA Civil Rights and Social Justice Section's Disability Rights Committee, board member of the Disability Rights Bar Association and representative of the Disability Justice Committee to the National Lawyers Guild National um, Executive Committee. Lydia founded the Fund for Community Reparations for Autistic People of Color's Interdependence survival and empowerment, and they're creating disability justice wisdom tarot. Lydia is past chairperson of the Massachusetts Developmental Disabilities Council and former Justice Catalyst Legal Fellow at the Bayes Lawn Center for Mental Health Law. Often their work, their most important work has no title, job description or funding, and probably never will. And with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Lydia X. G. Z. Brown. This is Lydia, pronouns they, them. I'm a youngish East Asian person with short black and teal hair and glasses, wearing a dark pullover in front of a blurred bookcase with a lot of things on it. 
And um, my cat is currently making very hostile direct eye contact from the side. And uh, I, I think that she wants something, probably food, probably because I literally just gave her a very large amount of food right before our event tonight. I fed you. You have food, eat it. Anyway, um, those of you who are here and also are possessed by cats uh, understand uh, what exactly is happening. In fact, for those of you who are here, who have your own floofs, I really wish that I were able to see them all, but I know that we actually can't do that in the webinar format. So I'll actually just invite you to send pictures of your floofs to me. It's the unofficial floof tax for participation in this evening's discussion. Uh, that is my number. Please send me pictures of your floofs. Um, I am eagerly anticipating their adorable faces. Uh, as we begin tonight, I would like to take a moment of pause uh, by way of introduction and to invite each of you to a moment of reflection and grounding. This is an invitation to consider where your body mind is in space, how well your body mind feels comforted or supported at this time, what it is that your body mind actually needs at this moment. This is an invitation for you to consider what it is you have carried with you into this virtual space this evening. Have you carried with you into this space your anger or rage, your grief? your sorrow, your exhaustion, your annoyance, your gratitude, your joy, or your excitement? What is it that you have carried with you into this space this evening? What do you need in order to feel comforted, supported, and cared for? The work that I do is grounded in the framework of disability justice, which will spend uh, quite a bit of time this evening unpacking and pulling apart. And one of the many lessons that disability justice teaches us is that all of our body minds have needs and our needs deserve to be met. All of our body minds have needs and our needs deserve to be met. The world that we live in, one which is pervaded by all ever-present ableism, all-encompassing, ubiquitous, affecting every part of modern life, that world teaches us that our needs are inconveniences or burdens, that our needs do not deserve to be met, that to ask for our needs to be met is somehow wrong. It is a moral failing. It is a reflection and a bad one on us. And I reject that notion. I invite you to, to reject that notion. And asking you to consider what you need to feel supported, what you need to feel cared for from wherever you are joining us. And I see that folks are joining everywhere from Ithaca, Rowan University in New Jersey. I'm sure many of you are in San Diego. Uh, someone's here from Boston. Uh, someone's in San Jose, San Mateo, Tacoma, Washington. Colorado Springs. By the way, you've got one Ethiopian restaurant in Colorado Springs. It's just okay. Um, everywhere you're all, where you're all from, ask me about it later after the talk, and I'm happy to talk to you about where all the Ethiopian food is and where those restaurants are. But wherever you are at this time, whether you are close or far from an Ethiopian restaurant that I would go to, it is an invitation for you to consider whether where you are now is meeting your needs. It is an invitation and a reminder that if you have access to the support and resources necessary to meet your needs, that you are not wrong or bad if you ask for those needs to be met. I invite you to ask for your needs to be met. I invite you to move, to change your physical location, to attend to what your body mind is telling you in this moment. And for those of you who are currently in a place where it is not possible to have your needs met, where you do not have access to the resources, the support necessary to have your needs met, that this is a reflection not on your value or worth, but on the state, the failed state of how things are at present in the world where we inhabit now. It is a reminder to all of us that the work that we are doing is the work of building and moving toward a future world. 
a world where we can each experience care and access, where we can learn what it means to have our needs met, not as simply an add-on, not out of reluctance or tolerance, but in due course, that our needs might be met because we are human and we deserve to have our basic needs for connection, for care, for love, for support to be met. The last note that I'll share as we move into the rest of our discussion this evening is a quick note on content. I will be speaking during our time together about some issues related to abuse and violence. I will be describing some types of abuse in brief, non-graphic detail. I will not be sharing images or video that depict violence or abuse, but I will be giving those descriptions. They are not meant to be graphic, but they will have some level of detail. At any time, if you need to move away, to pause, to hit the mute button, to take a break and then return, then I invite you to do that. You are welcome to move in and out of this space as you need. And I invite you to attend to your emotional needs just as much as to your physical ones. I will not necessarily assume that something has gone horribly wrong should you need to take that time to recenter, reground, or decompress, but rather as a reminder that each of our needs and capacities are constantly in flux and changing. As I mentioned before, the work that I do is predicated upon the principles, the values, and the framework of disability justice. But many folks do not have an adequate or clear understanding of what disability justice is and how it is distinct and separate from the frameworks of disability rights and disability awareness. Some of you may be intimately familiar with that distinction already, and for others of you, that might be the first time that you've encountered the difference. I want to pull back before we talk through the principles of disability justice and lay a clear foundation about what the problem is that disability justice seeks to address. And that problem is the problem of ableism. Some of you may have heard the term ableism before. It's often described as prejudice or discrimination. I define it a bit differently, but I'm gonna pause for a moment and invite you to share in the chat box. You can share to everyone or just to host and panelists what your understanding of ableism is. If you were asked to define ableism, how would you describe it? And you can go ahead and take a moment and I invite you to share that now. I'll pause and wait for you all to share in the chat. From Siley, perceptions of disabled folk as inferior. From Jennifer, viewing an individual with disabilities as less than. From Latifa, systemic oppression and marginalization of people with disabilities. Great, an excellent start. Let's give a moment for more folks to send in their responses. From Katie, any thought or process that excludes others with abilities different than my own. From Courtney, assumption of person's value based on certain areas of ability. From Sudha, viewing difference in body mind as deficit. From Nancy, seeing neurotypical people as superior. From Daniel, a system of oppression that aims to define what is normal and normative. It affects disabled and disabled people. I think you meant disabled and non-disabled people. It intersects racism and other oppressive systems too. Uh, from Janet, when we make assumptions about living and moving in the world from a preconceived notion of normalcy, quote unquote. Uh, from Angela, 
Uh, ableism is embedded into the fabrics of our everyday educational systems, and it's a tool of other isms. From Amna, putting people down based on their disabilities. Uh, I, I feel you, Daniel. It is hard to type on a phone. Uh, I applaud you for trying. Uh, from Emily, personal, structural, material, et cetera, consequences of individuals with body-mind differences and their interactions in oppressive and inaccessible spaces. From Miriam, justify and value every action from only able person's side. Uh, from Muhammad, able bodies are in control and charge of other individuals in society who might have some sort of disability. And from Katie, systems of oppressions that perpetuate discriminatory views and exclusionary practices of individuals with disabilities. Uh, you can keep sharing them if you haven't shared yet. Uh, I'm going to share a slide on screen that has uh, the definition that I use uh, in grounding conversation about ableism. And you'll see that many of your ideas are also reflected in that definition. So this was uh, a great way to introduce the concept. And uh, there, it's very different depending on the group of folks that I'm talking to, what kind of responses people have if I ask uh, about ableism in that way. Uh, the definition that you're seeing on screen shows a series of text broken down into four lines and then a sentence mentioned whose work has informed my development of this particular definition. At its most basic, ableism is a system of thinking and doing, that is, it's a values and belief system that harms disabled people or people with disabilities. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking about language in this conversation, but just to put a pin in it so that you know the language on that first line is deliberate, it deliberately uses both identity first and person first language for uh, very particular historically grounded and political reasons uh, relating to the history of disabled peoples and people with disabilities activism. So ableism is a system of thinking and doing that harms disabled people or people with disabilities. In other words, ableism is a form of structural, systemic, and institutional oppression. What that means is that ableism is a system of power relations and power differentials, wherein those people whose body minds are construed as healthy, normal, whole, well, stable, sane, strong, intelligent, and beautiful are granted enormous political, social, cultural, and economic power at the direct expense of those people whose body minds are instead construed as sick, unwell, defective, broken, crazy, deviant, unstable, dumb, and ugly. In other words, ableism is a value system that teaches us which kinds of people are fully human and which kinds of people are not. Ableism teaches us which kinds of people based on their bodily minded configurations or perceptions of those configurations are valuable, worthy, and desirable and which kinds of people, again, based on their body minds, are expendable and disposable. Ableism teaches us which kinds of people deserve to live, to breathe, to be, to literally take up space, and which kinds of people instead deserve not to exist at all, to be stamped out from existence and to be prevented from ever coming into existence again. In other words, ableism teaches us which kinds of people ought to reproduce and which kinds of people ought to be reproduced. Ableism teaches us which kinds of people ought to be allowed to have children and which kinds of children ought to be allowed to be born. Ableism is deeply wrapped up with, intricately interconnected with, necessary for, and dependent on every other form of oppression. Ableism is in particular profoundly racist and white supremacist, deeply tied with logics of empire and settler colonialism. 
it is particularly and perniciously anti-Black, anti-Native, and anti-Asian. What I mean by that is that ableism literally upholds and undergirds racism, white supremacy, and empire. And white supremacy feeds into all of our ideas about disability and disabledness. You can trace this conceptually in how we rhetoricize disability, what we think about as disability, how we respond to disability differentially and racially privileged, that is white people, as opposed to racially marginalized, as that is BIPOC, black, brown, indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and mixed race people. And it can also be traced historically, culturally, and politically throughout the history and the founding of this illegitimate nation through genocide, forced removal, and land theft, through the development of our modern economic reality by reliance on chattel enslavement of Black people, through the ways in which anti-Blackness and settler colonialism literally are the foundation and bedrock of this nation, and how each have depended upon furthered and accelerated logics of ableism. The logic of settler colonialism literally depends upon the logic of ableism applied at civilization scale. The belief that white Western Christian European nations are somehow innately and inherently superior to and necessary to save, to modernize, to democratize and to Christianize and civilize indigenous black, brown and Asian peoples, nations, cultures and civilizations globally and here within the borders of this land where we live now, that is the notion of ableism replicated onto the civilizational scale. The idea under white supremacy that abledness, health and wellness themselves are defined as whiteness, that whiteness is defined as the epitome of intelligence, as the epitome of health, as the epitome of wellness, as the epitome, as the epitome of sanity. This is literally the logic of white supremacy and ableism operating in tandem. The nexus of race and disability is impossible to disentangle into separate concepts or social realities. Our entire understanding of both race and disability operate together and depend on one another, even down to the ways in which we do or fail to recognize what counts as a disability. We are not incentivized to think of disability as it appears in negatively racialized communities because we are taught to define both abledness and disabledness as against whiteness. We are taught that to recognize abledness is to recognize whiteness. And that disabledness, if only from a hyper pathologizing pity and charity based framework is present only in whiteness. And you can observe that readily in the overwhelming whiteness of disability studies as a scholarly field in the overwhelming whiteness in popular and literary representation of disability, in the overwhelming whiteness in our assumptions societally that if someone mentions disability, the default assumption is that the disabled person or people in question must be white. And yet disability is more prevalent in every marginalized, colonized and oppressed community relative to every analogously privileged and resourced one, if only because of the ways in which disability shows up in our communities. And so many folks have talked about how this happens. Jen Deer in Water, D-E-E-R-I-N-W-A-T-E-R, Aza Atarefi, A-Z-Z-A, A-L-T-I-R-A-I-F-I, Talila Lewis, T-A-L-I-L-A, L-E-W-I-S, right, just to name a few. That was Jen Deerinwater, Aza Atarefi, and Talila Lewis are the names that I gave. I'll put those in the chat so that people can look up the work of the folks whose names I just mentioned.
the ways in which disability shows up because of environmental racism and climate catastrophe, cancers and autoimmune conditions and asthma caused by nuclear weapons testing, by poisoned water, by fracking, by oil pipelines leaking, by deliberately neglected or failed infrastructure in both rural and urban communities, the ways in which disability is exacerbated and caused by failure and neglect to provide medical and health care during pregnancy and during childhood, the lack of nutritious food for impoverished people living in food deserts, Deserts, literally the impact intergenerationally of trauma onto people's lives and how we don't acknowledge readily enough that trauma is itself a disabling experience. We are incentivized not to recognize manifestations of disability that show up more commonly or sometimes exclusively in marginalized and colonized and oppressed communities. And yet, because of the weaponization of ableism against marginalized communities, the ways in which ableism is used to uphold other oppressive systems and to further other oppressive systems, it is so common for many of us in marginalized communities to reject disability, to refuse association with disability, to believe that accepting any disability related labels or ideas is somehow to accept and internalize the colonizer or oppressor's view or understanding of our lives. And the reality is ableism and racism show up both in ways that accentuate the perceived disabled experiences of negatively racialized people and to erase the lived realities of disabled people of color. Ableism teaches us that only some people count as human and others do not, whether or not they are explicitly labeled or described as disabled. This is why, as one of you mentioned, and many folks in thinking and talking and writing about ableism recognize that ableism affects all of us. You do not have to be disabled in order to experience the devastating impact of ableism. Ableism teaches us what it means to be normal, well, and healthy, according to colonizing white supremacist and patriarchal norms about our labor, about our productions, about our bodies, about our appearance, about our behavior. And this is why if you look at our schools, disability is both over identified in black and brown students who are more likely to be sent to segregated institutional classrooms and schools. And disabled black and brown students are simultaneously less likely to be accurately identified and provided with appropriate autonomy enabling dignity respecting support. Both are true simultaneously. Why? Because of the nexus of ableism and racism. The last part of the definition that I shared, and I, I know I took it off the screen because I wanted to be able to uh, engage more directly with you and probably like everyone else I am, and you are likely zoomed out and very tired of staring at someone else's words on a screen. You can just look them up in another context. The last part of that definition is that ableism is deeply tied to eugenicists, thought, and to capitalist systems. What that means is that ableism is a value system about what kind of people ought to exist in the future, and ableism is a system that values us based upon our actual or perceived productivity and industriousness. Ableism impacts literally every aspect of our lives. Think just for a moment about the last year and a half. We have experienced a collective crisis. We have witnessed and are witnessing mass death. There is not a single one of us whose life has been untouched wholly by COVID-19. And yet, as many of us know very well, the impact of COVID-19 has not affected us each equally.
we know that those people who are most likely to be working or living in spaces and places where they would be at higher risk of exposure to and therefore transmission of an infection by COVID-19 were often queer and trans, black and brown, immigrant and disabled workers who were most likely to be working in frontline quote unquote essential positions, which are called essential and yet the least likely to be afforded fair labor protections, the most likely to be underpaid and to be precarious contingent work. We know that disabled people, particularly black and brown disabled folks, comprise the vast majority of people living in institutional and in carceral settings of all kinds, some by definition like nursing homes and psychiatric hospitals and others simply because of the impact of ableism and racism in the machines of mass criminalization and mass incarceration. And we know that those disparities Really, those injustices have only been magnified and accelerated in questions about for whom is it safe or safer to return to schools? Who is able to be, to be working more safely in a remote position? Who is able to be learning remotely or not? Who has been able to access vaccination or not? Who is able to access healthcare and treatment should they become infected with COVID-19 or not? And realities of white supremacy and ableism are never far from the answers to those questions. And yet, despite those realities affecting literally all of us in one way or another, we too were expected to keep working, to be productive, to labor, to be present, to perform, to succeed, to have the right attitude, to be social, to just keep doing things, meeting deadlines, showing up in spaces as if everything were fine. And the reality is we are not fine. We are not okay. None of us are okay. If I ask each of you, are you okay right now? And one of you says, yes, I'm fine. I think you're lying. So go ahead and share with me in the chat. Are you okay right now? How are you doing? How are you really doing? How are things for you? Do you feel supported? Ha are you rested? Do you feel totally calm? Do you feel like you have the space that you need to be present with partners, with family, to be able to reset, to be able to rest? Do you have the ability to rest? How are you actually. In February, 2020, I suffered a concussion. I remember showing up to teach in a classroom where my students meet in a seminar around a large table in one room. And I remember being in so much pain that I couldn't sit or stand straight up. And so I lied down on my back in that table in the middle of my classroom. My students sitting around were like, are you okay? And I was like, well, no. And there was a question of, you know, should I go home? And well, probably, but how? If I'm not really able to get up right now, how am I supposed to get home? And class discussion happened with my students sitting around that table while I made the table my sick bed. I didn't know quite yet that I had a concussion. I thought that it was just the pain of whiplash. And in the next couple of weeks, I learned that the aphasia, the acquired cognitive disabilities that I had begun to experience, the classic list of concussion systems, symptoms were in fact indicative that I did have a concussion. Less than one month after I suffered a concussion, we all went into quarantine. And I, like everyone else who teaches anywhere, was expected to suddenly shift the modality and curricula of my entire class from a fully in-person modality that assumed meeting in person every week to a completely virtual one with synchronous classes, regardless of where my students were, regardless of what their conditions at home were or if they had a home to go to. I was also told at the same time by the concussion doctor 
who I had the privilege of being able to see because I happen to have health insurance, which is not a given in this country, that I should not be doing any work that required intellectual thought and use of my brain or looking at screens. Yeah, I'm teaching college students and uh, we were told to switch to a virtual format so that we wouldn't all die of the novel coronavirus. So in order for me to minimally meet the requirements of the work that I was doing, I had to do the exact opposite of what the doctor advised me to do. I don't actually remember most of the spring 2020 semester. I know that it happened. Uh, my student evaluations were surprisingly positive. I don't know how, but they were. But I know that despite the awfulness of that experience, I had it easy. What has it been like for us in the last year and a half? Expected to just keep going and just keep moving. Ableism, you see, affects literally every aspect of our lives. It is embedded deeply there in the expectation that we just keep doing work. It is embedded in expectations about what it means to be sufficiently productive or industrious. It is embedded there in the expectation that you keep working even if you have a concussion, even if there is a global pandemic, even if like you going outside could mean that you, friends, partners, family members, children might die. Keep working, keep performing, keep creating rigorous course material so that you can prove that you were sufficiently intellectual that you were sufficiently intellectually stimulated, that your education really is worth what it is that you put into it. Keep going, meet these arbitrarily designated deadlines. Do it until your body breaks. Do it until your brain breaks. Do it until you break. Disability justice interrupts these cycles to remind us not only are we worth more than our production, but we are worth more than our performed happiness. We are worth more than our job titles. We are worth more than our ability to be seen as sufficiently contributing to society. We are worth more than what we are doing. We are worth more than our ability or perceived ability to function. That we are worthy even and especially when we're burned out, tired, and overwhelmed, as Daniel shared. That we are worth it and worthy, even if and especially we cannot work, even if and especially we are injured, ill, or dying. That we are worth it and worthy, even if and especially we are weak, we are struggling. We have lost capacities in certain areas, permanently or temporarily, that we are worth it even and especially when it is hard, when we can't find other people, when we can't find community, when we can't find support, when we can't find care. Disability justice, you see, picks up where disability rights fails. The framework of disability rights is predicated on changing our laws, our regulations, our public policy in order to change the social condition of disabled people. But what does law have to do with collective burnout and trauma and the failure of our cultural norms to account for the infinite possible variations of human existence? for our differential needs for care, for the complexities and the shifting realities and terrain of access. What does law have to do with the experiences of the largely black and brown disabled people subjected to electric shock for punishment in the Judge Rotenberg Center in Massachusetts? It's legal. It doesn't matter that the United Nations has condemned it. it doesn't matter that the Food and Drug Administration had attempted to ban the device, it's legal. What does law have to do with the reality that 
as many as 80% of all people who are incarcerated might be disabled. What does law have to do with the fact that developmentally disabled people are at least seven times more likely to be sexually assaulted than non-disabled people? What does law have to do with the fact that as many as 64% of people who are homeless living in the streets might be autistic? We've passed laws. The Individual with Disabilities Education Act was passed nearly half a century ago. The Americans with Disabilities Act was passed more than three decades ago. We have passed laws. Disability rights has failed us. Disability justice offers to us that the problem of ableism cannot be addressed solely by changing our laws, however necessary it may be. The problem of ableism is ultimately a cultural and societal problem. The problem of ableism is embedded into the values we hold about how we work, about how we live, about how we maintain and configure our relationships to others and to our own body, mind, and capacity. The problem with ableism is embedded much deeper and much wider than laws will ever be able to address. And so the work of disability justice and the wisdom of disability justice cultural workers and organizers and scholars is in thinking through to what the future might hold instead. If our present and our past are marked indelibly by the violence of ableism, its deprivations, its exploitation, its violence, what might the future hold instead? And how can we carve a path toward that future instead? What would it mean for us to think about the future that we actually want? What would it mean for us to vision concretely what liberation would feel like? It's nice as a concept. What would it feel like to be free? What would it feel like to be cared for? What would it feel like to have access without begging or pleading or screaming for it? What would it mean to experience love as radical praxis? What is the future we are building? What will that future hold? And can we remind each other if it is hard or impossible to tell ourselves this lesson? Can we remind each other that the future we are building is not just for the generations to come, although it is, but it is also for us. It is for now. We deserve that future. We deserve to be respected and honored and valued, not despite who we are or how we exist in the world, but for and as exactly who and what we are. For the relationships we hold, to those present in our lives, the relationships we hold to the communities from which we come, the communities to which we belong, the relationships we hold to the land that we inhabit. We deserve better than what we have now. We deserve a future of liberation now. It cannot wait. Disability justice offers us a clear way to understand the problem that we face and an opportunity to vision and build together. I'm done speaking. I don't remember what we're doing next in this program. <laughs> we can actually move to question and answer then. Thank you so much, Lydia. We have um, two of our uh, students with us. We have Samuel Bland and Monica Gonzalez, and they're each going to take some turns asking some questions that were submitted both from our audience tonight and then also um, things that they've come up with to, to talk to you about. Okay, so for question number one, Lydia, if you could change one thing about the education system in the US, what would it be? This is Lydia. 
Uh, it's really hard to say just one thing. So I'm going to take the easy route out and say, if I could change one thing about our current education system, it would be wipe all of it out and replace it. Thank you. Also, with this time, we're going through COVID and, you know, with the changing of education, how do you manage the frustration related to, you know, societal, you know, policies and the laws and it, it not progressing fast enough? How do you deal with that? This is Lydia. Uh, that's also kind of a hard question to answer, right? Because how do we deal with it? Well, I don't accept it. And yet that's our reality. So how I deal with it is by constantly doing uh, the work necessary in whatever way, publicly, not so publicly, in community, with other disabled people of color and disabled queer and trans folks to change and to challenge the conditions that we currently face. And that can be through those small ways in which I might have control, for example, in controlling the way that I teach and how I support my students and create an environment that is access centered and that values them as whole people that engenders and fosters care. Or it can be on the larger scale and thinking through and advocating for the changes necessary, whether formally through policy or not, to materially change the conditions that we are experiencing by ending harmful practices and undermining and disrupting harmful systems and by promoting development of and building better systems. Thank you, Lydia. I have a question. So what advice can you give new teachers about dismantling ableism in our space, like in our classrooms, in our workplace? This is Lydia. The number one piece of advice that I give to educators is to trust and believe your students, even the young ones, even the ones that do not have reliable verbal speech yet. Your students know what is working or not. They might not have the language of pedagogy or curriculum or instructional methodology, but they'll tell you with words or otherwise, what is working and what isn't. They will tell you if they feel safe or if they don't, whether or not they use those exact words or they frame it that way. Believe your students and trust your students. Let your students lead and support them in leading. Thank you, Lydia. I have another question. Can you describe an example from your experience in which an able-bodied individual was an effective ally? Um, yeah, there's actually a, a few different examples that come to mind. Um, one was in planning for a convening which would bring together both self-advocate leaders and non-disabled leaders together to one particular event. Uh, my supervisor at the time is a person who is not disabled. And one of the people who we'd asked to speak and participate in this convening uh, because of his disabilities, since we were asking him to get on a plane, he needed to fly in first class so that his wheelchair would be least likely to be destroyed. For those of you who don't know, people who use wheelchairs often experience their wheelchairs being destroyed by airlines, whether they are manual wheelchairs or power or electric chairs. And, um, and this person requested first class airfare in order to be able to fly to the convening uh, for both themselves, um, as well as for their partner who is also a support person for them. And I shared this information with my supervisor who was not disabled, expecting that there was a really good chance that seems very extravagant. Uh, we shouldn't do that. Like that's, you know, like literally a luxury. So like, why would we do that? And instead the response that I received was actually, oh, well, uh, we'll just move the numbers around and we'll make it work because if that's what this person needs for access and to be able to travel safely and to not have their wheelchair destroyed, then that's what we're paying for. And that's not the response that most of us usually get from people in positions of power or people 
who are in positions of authority in institutions, usually uh, we are told no, even if it's said apologetically or kindly, it's still a no. And so that was an instance in one very small way where someone who held more power and authority actually without any questions just said, well, if that's what's needed for access, then obviously it's what we're doing. There were no further questions. And that was an example of the kind of allyship that I wish a lot more people in positions of power would actually display. Of uh, You know what, we're going to actually put our money um, and our actions where our words are. Thank you, Lydia. We have a question in the chat, if we have the time. Okay, so there's a question that asks, how, but what are ways institutional efforts that like these at San Jose State cannot co-op but can maintain the commitment? This is Lydia. I'm sorry, I'm processing uh, that question. Um, right, it looks like it's the commitment to disability justice, I think, that Emily Nesbaum asked in the chat. Right. Um, for me, it has to do with uh, when an institution is lending money or resources, right? Who is that money and who are, who are those resources going toward, right? Are they going toward people who come from positions of privilege or are they going to people who are directly impacted from marginalized communities who are often deprived of access to resources? And when those resources are made available, are they made meaningfully available? Are they made available in a sustaining way? And is the university doing it just to bolster its own image or are they doing it because they're actually committed to the work of justice? And I asked that and all seriousness, look at how many of our universities literally got their endowments because they profited from chattel enslavement. Look at how many of our universities literally are occupying stolen land, land in, from which the native peoples who lived there were forcibly removed and don't acknowledge that and don't ever give any money or resources back to native people's nations and communities, like at all. Like do, do the folks who are here tonight, do you know like where you are? Do you know where the native people who are alive today land, resources, or money to Native peoples who were inhabitants long before the university was built on that stolen land. And so when I think about how are the universities actually practicing commitment to disability justice, I think about where is their power actually going? Where are their resources actually going? Who maintains power and are they willing to give it up? And if the answer to this question is no, then they are co-opting the language of disability justice because disability justice means the end of white supremacy. Disability justice means land back. Disability justice means the end of patriarchy. It's not an abstract concept. It is actual concrete action. Thank you, Lydia. looks like we are out of time for today. Um, I think we'll have Brian um, close us out if he's there. Yep. Sure, I can go ahead and do that. Um, I don't think I would have anything to add, but just say thank you so much, Lydia, for spending some time with us this evening. Thank you to uh, Siley and Suda uh, for organizing this event. Thank you to our panelists, Monica and Samuel for bringing those questions. Thank you to Heather for the introduction. Thank you to Verbit for providing the captions this evening. Thank you to all of you who attended this evening's event live and for all your engagement and participation. And anyone who's watching this record recording at a later date, um, Lydia just you dropped so much knowledge tonight and gave everyone so much to think about and all the different ways in which we can try to take action within our respective uh, kind of spheres of influence. So thank you again uh, for yeah, just all of your insights um, and yeah, it's echoed by everyone here in the chat. And I think we'll just end it with that. So thanks everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks all.
Thank you. Are we stopping the recording?